Hello, everyone. So I'm up here speaking, but this was highly collaborative work with the law firm of Stephen Gaffigan and their chief technologist, Sheen West. So before I talk about bulletproof credit card payment processing, I'm first going to motivate why, for us as security researchers, it's interesting to study our adversaries to understand their dependencies and understand intermediaries that are helping out these attackers in perpetrating various kinds of attacks on the internet. And I'm going to do this with a quick anecdotal example from some of the past research that I and some other researchers have done. And this was mapping out the dependencies of pharmaceutical spam. And so this example, there was a botnet. It sent out some pharmaceutical spam. There were some bulletproof registrars. There were some bulletproof hosting centers. There was a central kind of business entity that was called an affiliate program. And this affiliate program was paying a commission to the botnets for every purchase, every customer that they drove through these pharmaceutical affiliate programs. These pharmaceutical affiliates were also lining up banks to open up merchant accounts to accept payments for these illicit pharmaceutical goods. They were also contracting with pharmaceutical manufacturers in India to manufacture and deliver these goods into the US. So as you can see, this is a very complicated chain of events. And most profit-motivated adversaries these days don't pull off a scam end-to-end. -end. There's all of these dependencies. And if any one of these dependencies fails, essentially the botnet master doesn't get paid their commission for that sale. And so that's kind of the key point, is right, of trying to understand where's potentially a bottleneck where we could perhaps cut off their profits. And so this is an anecdotal example. We did another example where we looked at close to a billion spam messages, and we, in fact, found one of these bottlenecks. The bottlenecks that we found was in the merchant payment processing. So we found exactly three banks were responsible for collecting payments for 95% of the spam that we saw. So the close to 1 billion spam messages, there were just three banks. When we dug into this, we realized that there were very few banks that are willing to deal with what's called high-risk merchants. High-risk, it turns out, if you're selling pharmaceuticals over the internet without a prescription, you're at a high risk of getting fined from Visa. You're at a high risk of chargebacks. And there's very few banks that are willing to deal with these kind of merchants. The banks that are are going to insulate themselves from risk. They're going to do this by charging a lot of upfront money to protect themselves from those fines from Visa. And they're going to do a lot of due diligence to make sure that these illicit pharmaceutical sellers are good illicit pharmaceutical sellers. And they're not going to right, leave them holding the bag on a lot of um, chargebacks and things of that nature. And so to contrast this with, say, losing a domain name or hosting where they can replace these kinds of infrastructure and they get taken down minutes to hours for very low amounts of money, when they lose one of these merchant accounts, they're losing tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars for each one of these merchant accounts, and because of the due diligence, it's taking them days to weeks of lost sales to replace this. And so this was a very, um, we published the results of this. It got a lot of press, and Visa and MasterCard took notice of our findings. And in fact, they were willing to help out, and they enhanced their um, policing of these illicit merchants. So how they did this is they changed their agreements with the bank to elevate the fines. The fines now start at 25K, for the first illicit merchant account that Visa finds, and then they escalate to 100,000K, all the way up to perhaps um, threatening that bank with disassociation if they don't clean up their act and get rid of these bad merchants. And so with these enhanced um, fines in place, some brand holders actually stepped in and tried to reproduce our work. One of these brand holders was a major pharmaceutical brand holder. The other one was Microsoft looking at counterfeit software. And they both replicated our methods. And um, when we looked in the underground forums, we saw that their payment interventions were having great effect on the spammers. So they were not too pleased with this. Again, to contrast this with their normal reaction, when people were taking down domain names, hosting, they were taking down botnets, you don't see messages like this when that happens. This only occurred when we started hammering their payment processing end. And this had a great impact on them, virtually eradicated counterfeit software sales of Microsoft products, and had a large negative impact on the pharmaceutical spam sales on the internet. So this was, this was, right, this was a happy moment as researchers. So we had this huge impact where we had this bottleneck. Visa and MasterCard were willing to help us. Brand were willing to help us. And we were having great success. Unfortunately, after a little while, um, the brand holders stopped 
doing a strict policing of the payment. They kind of backed off of their payment interventions. The spammers noticed that they backed off. And once they noticed that they backed off, the coach was clear, and they ramped back up their operations to where they currently are today. So this was kind of a um, disheartening moment, right, as a researcher. Because we had this really good technique to undercut these spammers in terms of these merchant accounts, but we couldn't find a brand holder that was willing to do these interventions long term to keep them out. So um, you know, it was, it was a good moment and a bad moment at the same time. And I was a little bit disappointed because right, we had this method, but we couldn't find brand holders to sustain it. As luck would have it, about two years later, um, Stefan Gaffigan and his technologist approached me and said they wanted to recreate this in the luxury goods space. When they did this, I wanted to make sure that they were in it for the long haul. I wanted to make sure that they weren't going to back out like the other brand holders and that they were going to be in it for the long haul. So they found four luxury brand holders that said that they were in it. So if we could show results, they would keep up the pressure on these luxury um, counterfeiters. And so on July 9th, 2014, we started doing a payment intervention in the luxury brand holder space. These four luxury brand holders, I can't name them by name. They don't want to be named publicly because of some operational issues. Um, so before I talk about our payment intervention, I'm going to give you a quick primer on credit card processing as it's done on the internet today. And so right, you begin with a customer, let's say Alice. Let's say Alice is hungry. She wants a pizza. She finds Joe's Pizza Merchant online. She wants to buy, order a pizza with a credit card. She types in her credit card information, and a lot of people probably think that that credit card information goes directly to Joe's Pizza. In most cases, when you're dealing with a small merchant like this, it doesn't go directly to Joe's Pizza. It goes to what I call a middleman, which I'll call a payment processor. And First Data is an example of one of these payment processors, largest processor in the world. And so Joe's Pizza contracts First Data to handle essentially all of the details of credit card processing. And what First Data does is they go to a bank, and they set up what's called an acquiring bank. This is a bank account where they can accept payments for credit cards. And so First Data sets up this bank account and manages all the details of this. Joe has no control over this merchant account. It's all handled by First Data. And then when Alice types in her data, um, either First Data directly forwards it to the Visa network or the acquiring bank forwards it into the Visa or MasterCard networks. And when this happens, then the Visa and MasterCard networks need to correctly route this payment authorization to the issuing bank that issued Alice's credit card. Because Visa and MasterCard don't actually do any direct settlements of payments, they just simply maintain a network for acquiring and issuing banks to settle payments between each other. And so what happens here is when that customer information from Alice goes into this network, the first six digits of that is what's called the bank identification number. The bank identification number, um, normally abbreviated as a BIN, is um, six digits that essentially identifies the issuing bank of Alice's credit card. And so with that information, Visa and MasterCard can route it to the correct issuing bank. When that happens, then that issuing bank can look at it and either choose to accept or decline that purchase based on a number of different factors. Let's say that they accept it. That will be relayed to the acquiring bank. The acquiring bank will then relay that to First Data. First Data will relay that to Joe's Pizza. Joe's Pizza will cook up a pizza, deliver it, and Alice will be happy and fed. The other side is in terms of how to trace purchases. When you're doing one of these payment interventions, you can't just give Visa or MasterCard a URL and say, hey, I want you to shut down the merchant account for this URL. In fact, Visa and MasterCard do not have any mapping between the URL and the merchant account at a bank. What's required here is to do a trace purchase in order, so you need to have a successful purchase where you have that acquiring bank trying to authorize money from an issuing bank. And when that happens, you can actually trace this purchase. And so this is something that I have a good deal of experience with. Um, the law firm contacted me for a reason. They contacted me because I had done close to 800 of these purchases in the illicit pharmaceutical space, and I knew fairly well how to maneuver these systems and get these illicit goods sellers to actually authorize credit cards. And so with this, we began our payment intervention. The first thing you need to do, right, is you need to find um, websites that are selling these pharmaceutical goods. In, this, in the case of luxury goods, they're all over the place. They use spam. They spam online social networks. They also poison search results. So you can just simply type in these search terms, and you'll find a number of sites selling counterfeit goods. In this case, um, these are compromised 
universities' websites that are used effectively as doorway pages. So they go in, they compromise university websites, and when you click on one of these results, these compromised websites, in fact, UCLA is not selling counterfeit Beats by Dre, they've been hacked, and you'll go to this Beats by Dre store. You'll be redirected to the actual counterfeit goods store. So now a customer can simply navigate this until they wish to purchase. When they want to purchase, they'll normally be redirected to a third-party site. And these are what I call payment gateways. So I've, I've, I've purchased a lot of counterfeit goods on the internet. For anyone else that's purchased counterfeit goods in the room has probably seen these two payment gateways. And these two payment gateways map back to two of the middleman payment processors. They map back to a company called ReallyPay and a company called Payworks. Both of these are Chinese credit card processors. And when I began this intervention, I really hoped that these Chinese payment processors were not complicit in the scam. I hoped that they were being duped by the merchants and that they really didn't know the nature of the goods that they were selling. However, as I did more and more investigation on online forums and talked with these illicit merchants, I found out that, in fact, there's a whole bunch of these payment processors, and, in fact, they are bulletproof. They know, they fully know that they're supporting um, people that compromise people's machines, that sell counterfeit goods, and they tailor their services to these kinds of customers. So we've mapped these out. You can go to underground forums. You can see when one of these merchants says, I want to sell counterfeit goods. Some, right, some set of these payment processors will reply and say, I can offer you the merchant processing for your goods. And I've also contacted them posing as a merchant. I've told them that I'm going to sell counterfeit goods, and they're perfectly happy to supply me with merchant accounts. So they're very much bulletproof payment processors. And again, they tailor their services to try and protect their merchants from being discovered. And when I initially started the payment intervention, their standard methods were essentially off-the-shelf anti-fraud detection methods. So there's lots of companies, third-party companies, that sell standard fraud detection. These are meant to insulate merchants from right, fraudulent purchases, and they kind of have a knob. So they have a knob where you can have them fairly relaxed, or you can crank up that knob and have them very paranoid. When you crank up that knob and have them fairly paranoid, they'll check your IP address, make sure that it matches geolocates close to the billing address, um, they'll do address verification, where they check the name and address of the customer's credit card with the issuing bank, and they'll also have things like VPN lists, lists of Tor servers, and they'll block purchases from these. So these are kind of standard things that I'm fairly um, versed with, right, getting purchases, they'll pass these kind of anti-fraud services. Okay, so I begin, right, my undercover operation as a mystery purchaser to push through these purchases from these counterfeit merchants. And the first technique that I normally use is I have an agreement with a prepaid credit card issuer that will issue prepaid credit cards in my name and names of other people that have agreed to make purchases for me. And so this was my first attempt. We went to this prepaid credit card issuer, and all the purchases were blocked. So as part of that anti-fraud system, they also had a list of all the bank identification numbers of prepaid gift cards, and they were blocking those by default. Okay, so the next thing that I do is I have an incorporated company, LLC. I've opened up a business account with a major U.S. issuer, and I issue credit cards to myself and other people that agree to make purchases. And the problem with this is that there's only one bin. So all these credit cards are in one bin, but it's not a prepaid gift card bin. And so this was successful for about three or four months before these bulletproof processors, right, they, they started getting the fines, and they realized that someone was after them. They did the analytics, they found out the bin, they blocked the bin. I tested this by recruiting fresh purchasers that hadn't ever made a purchase, and they were blocked before their first purchase. So this was the beginning of the arms race with these bulletproof credit card purchasers. So they've gone through a list of techniques to try and block me. They began blacklisting IP addresses. If you live pretty much um, within a three-mile radius of where I live in Manhattan, you probably can't purchase counterfeit goods because I've used all the coffee shops <laughs> in the area. So, 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 so sorry. Um, we also started using, instead of business class cards, we started using consumer cards out of consumer bins. They can't block these bins outright because this is where the majority of their legitimate customers come from. So they began point-wise blocking our credit card numbers. Um, they also started blocking our billing address, and I can change all of this, so I can do experiments changing all of this to see what they're blocking. However, there's one piece of information that I can't easily change, and that's my name. 
So um, in fact, they've gone to blacklisting people's names if you continue doing this. And so my name and the names of a lot of my purchasers are now blacklisted. And so um, this has made us try and fan out. And I'll talk about how we fan out. The other thing that they've done is they've injected tracking scripts and device fingerprinting scripts into their merchant sites and their payment gateways. The most effective thing that they did is they looked for the refer. So they saw how you got to the counterfeit site in the first place. Originally, right, we were giving direct URLs to the counterfeit sites to our purchasers. They were clicking on them. The, URL, the refer was empty. And right, virtually no real customer comes directly to these sites. They come to them through these hacked gateways. So then we had to train our purchasers to come organically to these websites through the gateways. Once we did that, interestingly enough, they removed all the tracking code. They realized that it wasn't effective, and it was probably creating false positives on their end. The other thing that they did is they um, kind of added a few notches to their anti-fraud system, where for only for certain brands, the brands that were involved in this payment intervention, they basically rate limit them to the one purchase and they were blocked. I tested this out by um, purchasing non-counterfeit goods from the same sites, and they would let those purchases through. So they're very well aware of what brand holders are after them, and they've kind of added a few notches to their blocking methods for these particular brands only. The other thing that they've done that has unfortunately been effective is they've begun sharing customer information between a number of processors. So before I join these processors, I have their code. I can map back which processors are supporting which websites. However, what they started to do is they started to share this information between processors. So before I carefully write, I striped a purchaser across multiple of these payment processors so they could at least get one purchase from each payment processor. However, I noticed when they did a purchase at one payment processor, they weren't just banned from that one. They were banned from all the ones that were sharing the information with each other. So I began having to map out how they were sharing information and strategically map between those groups my purchasers. And so this obviously, right, has put a lot of pressure on me to kind of expand my network of payment of purchasers larger and larger. And so originally, right, I, I had awkward conversations with my family, my close friends, where I said, hey, do you want to purchase some counterfeit goods on your personal credit cards? And so, of course, right, you're laughing. Um, the thing that a lot of people were worried about was credit card fraud. Ironically enough, these bulletproof credit card processors actually don't do fraud. Um, these, are, these are legitimate bulletproof credit card processors. They're in the business of payments. They don't do credit card fraud. So we've never had an instance of credit card fraud from these payment processors. So while this um, worry exists, it's hard to get rid of. And so effectively, I had to take a page from the cyber criminals, and I started an affiliate program where I reward people for successful purchases, and I reward them for recruiting more and more people into my networks. So this has been highly successful, and I have a queue of people, over 100 purchasers at this point. And so this has basically rendered null and void all of their anti-fraud methods at this point. So just quickly, here's some results of our payment intervention. So it's been ongoing for 17 months. Um, we've again seen this bottleneck of these banks. So we've seen three Chinese banks that process for 97% of the test purchases that we've completed. We've mapped out 15 of these payment processors that are bulletproof. We've completed 313 successful purchases. So picture a row of um, tables full of counterfeit goods that we've purchased at this point. We've mapped out 242 unique merchant accounts. Each one of these has resulted probably in a fine from Visa to that bank. And all of them have either been terminated or are in the process of being investigated and will likely be terminated soon. I've also researched the business model of these bulletproof payment processors. So they operate is they charge you an initial um, annual subscription fee of about $775. My guess is that they're actually not making a profit on this. What they're probably doing with this is this is turning into an insurance pool that they're using for fines. So as long as right, one out of 40 of these accounts gets mapped out, they pay the fine out of this money, they're perfectly fine with that. Probably where the profits are coming from is the elevated transaction fees. So they're paying about twice what a legitimate merchant would pay in terms of credit card transaction fees. A legitimate merchant would pay about 2 to 3 percent. They pay about 4 to 6 percent. And they don't pass on the fines to the merchants. So that's covered by the insurance pool of the annual fees. The, OK, so when we began this, we saw two banks, a Korean bank and the Bank of China. After about three to four months, the Korean bank stopped issuing accounts to these merchants, and they started getting accounts from the other two major Chinese banks, so the Bank of Communications in China and the Agricultural Bank of China. 
and these account for 97% of the accounts that we see. So to quickly wrap this up, we found these bulletproof processors that have um, basically strengthened a weak part of the spammer infrastructure. They're aiding these spammers by trying to block them, trying to stymie our payment intervention at every step. We found these three banks that continue to work with these bulletproof processors. The bank in, of Korea, right, did something to get rid of these merchants. The banks in China aren't taking similar steps to get rid of these kinds of merchants. The other thing that um, makes this a little bit difficult is that Visa isn't transparent about the fines that they're finding these banks. So we have no idea if they're escalating the fines. My guess is they aren't escalating the fines, and they clearly haven't disassociated these large Chinese banks from their payment networks. That would probably be very difficult for them to do. So with that, I show you um, a picture of our one victory of really pay closing down. And any questions, please feel free.